So a lot of you may be aware that I am actually a pretty big fan of the Alien movies, like more than the normal kind of film nerd guy. Like I love all four of these movies from the quadrilogy. I ironically enjoy the Alien vs. Predator movies. And as for Prometheus and Alien Covenant, um... I think the Alien movies are the ultimate sci-fi horror movies. It takes the cosmic setting of space, which is already a really horrifying setting, and then adds an alien creature that births itself by infecting a host with its embryo, which then blows its way from said host's chest and grows into an eight-foot tall armor-plated killing machine. I was actually going to do Alien 3, and I'm still going to at some point down the road, but that's a long video, so we're going to start much like the hamster that writes mysteries known as J.B. McGregor by starting at the end ending and working backwards. But really, the reason I'm doing this backwards is because uh, it takes a lot less time to do Alien Resurrection than it does any other movie in the series. And I can focus on it and get like a 25-30 minute video out of it. Very low impact because I'm coming out of my video rut. So it's safe to say that after Alien 3 ended on a complete downer, fans were left a little bit unsatisfied. The theatrical version of the movie specifically was a complete train wreck, and it let down moviegoers because there was still a lot of hype coming off of Aliens, despite there being a seven-year gap between movies. While all this was happening, Joss Whedon wrote a script that was actually intended to be more of a parody of the Alien series that was never supposed to be made, but somehow he ended up showing it to Fox, and they liked it, and they ended up making the movie and playing it straight. So now the big question, was, were they going to be able to get Sigourney Weaver back? Because she really didn't want to do Alien 3. She was not enthusiastic to do that. And from what I understand, you know, part of the negotiations for her returning for that was to have her character killed off. Of course, there is a magical solution to getting an actor to come back to a movie franchise that they had long ago washed their hands of. And as Sigourney Weaver put it, I didn't want to do another movie, but Fox drove a dump truck full of money up to my house, so I couldn't say no. <laughs> They drove a dump truck full of money up to my house. I'm not made of stone. <laughs> Is that truly the foundation for a good movie? To bring back the main character who died in the climax of the last movie via the use of an excessive amount of cash to secure the actress. I wouldn't say it's the foundation of a good movie, but I actually do like Alien Resurrection anyway, despite the fact that it is easily the dumbest movie, third dumbest, fifth dumbest movie in the series, pending Romulus. I'm not gonna go too much into the production because, like, Alien 3 is just gonna be, like, a production documentary, essentially, when I do that one, but the basic idea is Fox wants to try and bring the franchise back. They wanted Weaver back because it was felt that she was the franchise and they couldn't just make an alien movie without her, and then they had to come up with a MacGuffin to bring her back because she incinerated herself in 3. So the script had the timeline jump 200 years into the future, and through some blood samples that Clemens took in 3, they were able to clone Ripley. The weirdest decision this movie made, besides the plot itself, was the decision to bring in French director Jean-Pierre Junet. He was hired to direct this despite the fact that he had no interest in a career career in Hollywood and just wanted to do his French movies. But hey, it was once again a case where the money was just too attractive for someone to say no. Oh, they drove a dump truck full of money up to my house. I'm not made of stone. <laughs> However, because they have Jeanne in the movie, there's a lot of weird art house moments, but I wouldn't really go as far as to call this like an art house film. Like, it's very reserved, but they do some questionable things with the filmmaking. Questionable in the context of an alien movie, not in the context of filmmaking. And the whole setup for the script itself is very similar to another work by Joss Whedon. Firefly. It's basically the concept of Firefly, but as an alien movie. And it continues the Alien series' long-running relationship with corporate satire. This time I'm taking the more 80s Cold War era satire into the late 90s. So let's just dive into Alien Resurrection. So for those of you who are a little bit, you know, more casual with the Alien franchise, every movie in the original quadrilogy has an extended version.
and Alien Resurrection is no exception. So I'm not going to be doing the theatrical version, I am going to be looking at the extended version, but I am going to, you know, I'll point out stuff that was added in if it's important to point out that it was added in, but for the most part I am looking at the most complete version of the movie, which I will go ahead and say I believe is the extended one. But I'll go ahead and note that director Jean-Pierre Jeunet stated himself that he feels the theatrical version is the complete version of the movie and the extended cut is merely a gift for the fans. And I'm gonna go ahead and say it, this extended cut doesn't really introduce a whole lot of new footage, like it's only seven minutes. So it's not like the Alien 3 extended cut or Aliens extended cuts where it's like there's like a sizable amount of things added. Nor is it like Alien where while the cut was shorter, it added a lot more scenes including a very famous lost sequence. All Alien Resurrection really adds is some cool pickup shots, a new introduction, and some more character moments, and expanded dialogue. For example, the opening sequence in the original is just some weird stock opening with like some graphics and shit in the back, like the Queen Alien egg sack or whatever. But in the extended version, there's a whole like cool little opening sequence where you see this little bug and you think, oh, it's an alien, but now it's just a bug, and then we see the exteriors of the Aruga spaceship in which the movie takes place. Aruga, Ara I can't pronounce it. I'm not going to try. Even though I watched the movie, I'm just... It, it's funnier when I pronounce things wrong because it makes me look like a moron. So yeah, it opens up, like, right in the shit. They're cloning Ripley to get the Xenomorph Queen out of her body. But it's a, it's a little far-fetched because I don't know, like, how this would work. It's stated in the treatment for the film that they used blood from the doctor's office on Fury 161, the setting of the previous movie, and that that blood was taken while she was impregnated with a Xenomorph. And Xenomorph... Xenomorphs, as we know, are very invasive. They alter your DNA before you give birth to them. But one could assume that because she was impregnated when the blood was taken, they could theoretically create a clone that also was pregnant with a Xenomorph queen. And that's exactly what they do. They use science to recreate her as an infected host. I, it's hard to really explain it, but it's a movie. So it's like right off the bat, you know, it's just a company that wants the aliens as a bioweapon. But instead of being a company, it's a military. And now, after centuries, they finally got got specimens on board a research ship. Oddly enough, though, they, they didn't expect the Ripley clone to survive, but she actually does manage to survive the procedure, and she heals after breaking a doctor's arm. This results in Ripley 8, the eighth clone, which we'll figure out why she's called that later, being a secondary science project aboard the Aruga because her DNA hybridized with Xenomorph DNA. So we do get the scenes of them trying to help with her, like, reading and memory comprehension and cognitive function in the original, but the extended cut really does more with them. And it lets Sigourney Weaver do a bit more acting. One of the reasons Weaver returned besides the dump truck full of money was because Ripley 8 was a different character from Ripley and it would have allowed Weaver to do more acting. And the clone Ripley in Alien Resurrection is someone who is developmentally challenged and possibly autistic. This is because, you know, she was cloned and aged up and still has a bit of that xenomorph DNA in her brain. Because of the whole cloning thing, she doesn't really develop social skills that an adult of that age should have, nor does she she have emotional intelligence leading to outbursts. Sigourney Weaver herself has admitted that she is on the autism spectrum, so it's nice to see representation done by someone who isn't just pretending to be autistic like they do with, like, the good doctor and shit. I would go so far as to say, without even trying, this is one of the better cases of a movie portraying a character with some form of autism. Fork. Fuck. It's, it's fork. And this is shown in the theatrical cut, but there are extended sequences in the special edition that I think work with it a lot better. We get to see Sigourney Weaver do a lot of acting, but with not a lot of dialogue in these scenes, which is always, it's hard to do that, to just kind of act through body language and connect with the audience. But she does it well. There's a scene where they're showing her pictures, and you know, she has to say what they are, because they're trying to get her, like, word association, whatever you would call it, going. And she sees a picture of a little girl that looks kind of like Newt, and a little smile goes across across her face, but then she starts getting really sad because, you know, she's got the memories of this person, but they're, they're incomplete. All she knows is that this is someone who once made her very happy, and then, you know, she died. She gets this point across on screen without uttering a single word of dialogue, and that's why Sigourney Weaver is awesome. And trust me, I've said some bad things about the idea of bringing Ripley back for an alien movie now, because I really wouldn't want to see an alien movie with Ripley now, because Sigourney Weaver is, like, old. 
and they killed the character off, like, they could maybe do a follow-up to Resurrection, but we all know they're not gonna do that. They're just gonna do the whole fucking soft reboot thing, and we don't need to see that. I don't think we need to diminish the quadrilogy by doing that. Sure, 3 and Resurrection aren't great movies, but they have great moments like this that I just don't want to see, like, you know, buried underneath whatever crap they would put out as a reboot. I don't need to see Sigourney Weaver showing up like Harrison Ford simply just to get a payday. <laughs> Hell, she already did it in this, and she did a good job of it, but nevertheless. People tend to forget that Sigourney Weaver went to goddamn Yale for acting. Like, she understands the psychology of a role on a higher level than a lot of actors past, present, and presumably future would. And I'm gonna go ahead and say I have more negative things to say about this movie than positive things, but Sigourney Weaver's performance is not one of the negative things. Another thing that you won't hear me say anything negative about is the cast and the casting and the characters, because the cast in this movie makes up for the uh, cast in the previous movie, like, 100%. And that's not to say I dislike the characters in Alien 3, but especially in the theatrical cut, very few of the characters really stand out from one another, and it doesn't help that they all have shaved heads and are British. Oh, fuck! Resurrection fixed that problem right away because it has a cast of decently noteworthy names and talented character actors. Sigourney Weaver, Winona Ryder, Ron Perlman, Dan Hedaya, Brad Dorff, J.E. Freeman, Michael Wincott, Leela Norser, and Raymond Cruz, just to name a few. In fact, to name most of the cast. I literally named every noteworthy person in the cast. And yeah, sure, Raymond Cruz wasn't noteworthy at the time, but knowing that he'd go on to play Tuco on Breaking Bad and become very well known certainly makes his appearance a positive when re-watching this movie 27 years later. My god, I'm old. There are some issues here, both in the plot and in the writing, which I guess are the same thing, but nevertheless, General Perez is played by a very hammed-up Dan Hedaya. Like, they make it clear that Perez has objections to keeping Ripley 8 alive, as she has some memories of her past life and is slowly getting more of them back. This is because Ripley was obsessed with wiping the Xenomorphs out of the universe, and it would kind of endanger whatever they're doing on board the ship. Now, what bothers me here continuity-wise is kind of petty because, yes, yeah, it's just a movie, and yeah, it's only treating the past three movies as canon, but first of all, the whole concept of Alien and Aliens is that there's an implication that the Xenomorphs are not native to LV-426. You see them on the space jockey's ship. You know that they're a bioweapon for another alien race that likely died out centuries ago. And while all the LV-426 Xenos are probably wiped out completely, it does not mean that there aren't other aliens somewhere in the known universe. So when Perez says, Ellen Ripley died trying to wipe this species out. For all intents and purposes, she succeeded. It's egregious because chances are they probably could have found another egg site somewhere. It's just, you know, kind of a needle in the haystack thing, I guess. So technically, like, if you go 200 years without finding another egg clutch, yeah, sure, you'd have to resort to the cloning. But, you know, to say that they're wiped out, I don't like this, it bothers me. And, like, there's stuff in the extended universe that implies that they're just, like, out there in the universe. You just gotta find them. Another thing that kind of bothers me is, like, the consistency of what Ripley remembers. So, here's the thing. Memories from a clone is a weird subject. I wouldn't understand the science behind it. I don't think we understand the science behind it. So this is speaking purely theoretically, but I imagine whatever memories Ripley had stopped at the point in which the genetic material was taken out of her. And if I had to guess, the genetic material would have been taken out of her probably when Clemens was taking care of her after the ship crashed on Fury 161. So one could assume that the memories based on the genetic material would not be aware that she was impregnated with a Queen would not have actually remembered the events of Alien 3 at all and would not be aware that Newt died or that there was a stowaway face hug. She wouldn't be aware of anything. And I get it, suspension of disbelief. They don't exactly state that she is aware that she was impregnated. But to make this work, you know, you can just assume that the blood was taken out of her like shortly after the Newt funeral segment, I guess. Does it grow? Very rapidly. It's a queen. How did you know that? She'll breed. You'll die. Alright, so I actually have to step back here a second because while I was cutting that last little clip, I was like, oh shit, no, in the extended cut they actually do make a pretty overt reference to the fact that she has little to no memory of Alien 3. Play the damn Castlevania music.
And as for how she's aware there's a queen, well, because she is a hybrid human xenomorph, she is connected to their hive mind. So, like, that kind of fixes it, but it's still, it's still a touchy thing. I get why they chose to leave this vague. And we're lucky that I like this movie, and I like Weaver in it, and I like the Ripley 8 character, because I would just be picking this apart a lot more if I didn't. Anyway, Ripley is recovering well and is regaining cognitive function, but we see early on that she has some aggression that makes her super strength from the xenomorph DNA a little bit more dangerous when coupled with her emotional comprehension. As mentioned previously, the character of Ripley 8 is autistic. Well, they say that... She's freaked. It has connective difficulties caused by a biochemical imbalance causing emotional autism, certain reactions... Oh, oh, wait a second. And I don't know how accurate that term is, but it works, I guess. Remember, this movie was made in 1997. They did not have the type of awareness of autism that we have today, and quite frankly, this is still more tasteful than The Good Doctor. I am... Retarded. Some may say that Sigourney Weaver's chewing the scenery in this movie, and while some lines are a bit mud, I think it really kind of pushes the notion that while well, Ripley 8 is a clone of Ripley, she's an imperfect clone with low emotional intelligence and a lack of social maturity, so it works that she hams it up a bit and acts out. I look at Ripley 8 as a much different character, as was intended for this movie. And, you know, 20 or so minutes in, we get introduced to the proto-Firefly portion of the movie, where we meet the scrappy group of space rogues or mercenaries or pirates or whatever. Elgin, Jonner, Hillard, Vries, Christine, Call. Very interesting characters, but sadly, besides Jonner, Call, and Vries, we don't really get enough room to, like, learn about them. All we really know is that they're space mercenaries who drink a lot and break the rules by sneaking weapons onto the ship and some booze. I think what little we do get could be considered a highlight of the film. It's clear they don't all like each other, like Jonner is addictive Vries, Call seems to be protective of Vries, and it's like they're kind of just working together for business purposes purposes. There's no, like, close brotherhood here between the entire group, just certain members. And Christy was actually meant to be two different characters, but they decided to just merge them into one, and as a result, we get a cool black dude from the late 90s with dreadlocks and hidden guns in his sleeves. Now, the reason there are space pirates is because the United System military needs some live subjects to do their xenomorph testing, and these pirates have some cargo. And by cargo, we mean crew people of a ship that were put into stasis and kidnapped to be impregnated by facehuggers. And yeah, it's not Wayland doing the experimenting this time because Wayland Utani went out of business. According to this line of dialogue, they were bought out by Walmart, which is, yeah, this is around when Walmart started getting really big, so it's pretty funny. Wayland Utani. Ripley 8's former employers. Terran Growth Conglomerate. They had defense contracts under the military. Oh, they went under decades ago. Get them in way before your time. Bought out by Walmart. I think by leaving the Ripley character as more of a minimalistic blank slate, but by no means skipping on her development, it allows Alien Resurrection to have a cast of supporting characters that are comparable to the Marines and Aliens. Yeah, I said it, these characters are solid and interesting, and are different from the Marines while still playing a similar purpose in being in a situation that they couldn't have possibly prepped for, and you get some pretty good development with them and they're all very entertaining. Even the non-space pirate characters like General Perez, who's kind of a ditzy incompetent, is still an interesting character, especially during his interaction with Elgin. Elgin, Elga, I don't, not meh. Particularly laughed at this line about Winona Ryder's character call because I agree with it completely. She makes an impression. <laughs> she is severely fuckable, ain't she? <laughs> Mighty handy with a monkey wrench, too, I might add. So it's pretty obvious that most of the space pirates are ex-military, so Elgin and Perez do know each other. They probably took similar paths, but they forked at some point. Fuck. Fork. They have a good rapport because Elgin points out how it's very suspicious how the United Systems military is doing experiments outside of their territory, resulting in Elgin basically being able to leverage Perez into a few days room and board aboard the Aruga under conditions that they're probably going to break within an hour of being there. Not you, nor any of your formidable crew members will go anywhere near restricted areas. Rule number two. Not 
trouble. Good behavior. Good behavior. No fights. No fights. No fights. No fights. I want to give some credit to Brad Dorff as Dr. Gettyman and J.E. Freeman as Dr. Wren. Like, they are so slimy. It is just a joy to watch them be assholes. Sadly, Gettyman doesn't get as much screen time as he should, but, like, Dr. Wren is just great. They try to do the whole thing, oh, well, we're not the corporation, we're the military, and Ripley is not reassured. The whole purpose of them doing research with the xenomorphs is obviously to have bioweapons, but they mention that the xenomorphs can serve other purposes, which I actually find very interesting and find it funny that this was never actually brought up as a point in the other movies like yeah the xenomorphs have a very weird adaptive biology and a strong immune system and they probably could make a killing for medical research but ripley remains skeptical which is what got her killed in the first place so shut up ripley after really building up on the whole thing where Ripley has increased strength and durability from the xenomorph DNA, we get a good display of that with the gymnasium fight, which I actually love this scene. Like, it's just her beating space pirate ass. Like, it's, this is the most actionized she's been in the entire franchise, and I'm okay with it. I like Perlman being a fucking asshole here. Like, Ron Perlman is like, he's one of those actors I never really appreciated, but like, every time I see him in something, I'm like, oh man, this guy's great. basketball I know some other indoor sports okay so they do this thing where Ripley makes a basket you know looking away that whole trick and they actually allowed Sigourney Weaver a handful of tries to make that basket and she kept fucking up so the director Jean-Pierre Junet eventually said fuck it we're just gonna CGI it however Weaver asked for a few more tries and on the very last one she made that basket like what you're seeing there is not CGI she actually made that basket notice how fast it cuts and that's because Ron Perlman and the other actors turned to the camera and said stuff like holy shit as soon as it went in. So not only did Weaver make a nearly impossible shot to make, but everyone was in such shock that they almost ruined the take. Hey, that rhymed. It's weird, this kind of throws me off. Like, the cargo that the pirates brought in is all hosts for xenomorphs, but it also seems like they already have quite a few xenomorphs already. And we all know the incubation period of xenomorphs in the movies is just, like, really inconsistent. Sometimes it takes a few hours, sometimes it takes a few minutes, but, you know, I'm just going to assume that they already had some and that this is all taking place in a very short period of time. Brad Dorff acts like the fucking lunatic in this movie and I wouldn't have it any other way. Like he plays a literal mad scientist who seems fascinated with both Ripley and the Xenomorphs. I'm gonna go ahead and say it, H.R. Geiger was not happy with the design of the Xenomorphs in this movie. It was another movie where they left him out of the design process. And he's quoted as saying that they look like shit. And that's not just like a colorful description. No, he said they actually look like fucking turds. They do look a little different in this movie. Movie. They're a lot more fleshy, they're not very biomechanical, and I guess that can be attributed to the fact that their DNA has been corrupted with human DNA, but yeah, I'll agree with H.R. Geiger, they do look a little fecal. This scene with Brad Dorff acting all weird and like following the xenomorph around is like one of the signature scenes in the movie as it not only demonstrates the intelligence of the xenomorph when it recognizes the liquid nitrogen button, but it also demonstrates why William H. Macy walked out of the audition for this character. Like yeah, they didn't say which scene William H. Macy read for but the story goes that he like started reading it looked at the script looked at the people there and he was like yeah this isn't gonna work and he walked out but uh brad dorf doesn't give a shit he just like he just went for this like i was half expecting him to pull his fucking dick out and start pounding it he he loves those xenomorphs <laughs> there's one for a new movie a scientist like tries to have sex with the xenomorph because he's fucked <laughs> I really wish we got more scenes of the pirates just doing pirate things. Like, we have Call drinking with Jonner and Christy, and she spills their drink. Hey man, that shit is not easy to come by! Actually, hold on a second. There are no weapons allowed on board, sir. My own recipe. Way more dangerous. 
So I'm trying to remain positive about this movie, even though I have stated, well, I do like it, there are a lot of negatives, but I do have to point out, how is your own recipe hard to come by? Come on, Joss Whedon, I expect more from the guy who wrote that show that everybody loves but I don't give two shits about. And what do you know, calls up to no good and breaks into Ripley's cell to kill her, but realizes that she has already had the queen removed, and how would Call know all of this? Yeah, we'll figure it out later, but we get to see the great performances of Sigourney Weaver and Winona Ryder when Call and her have a little moment together that kind kinda leans into a lesbian tease territory. Not that I mind, I love lesbians and everything. But then, you know, I don't know how many lesbian moments kind of end in like, the, the, the bottom, offering to euthanize the top, like, if there's any lesbians that watch my channel, let me know if that's a thing. But yeah, Ripley ain't all about that, and we learn that, well, she's kind of at an emotional maturity level of about a, I would say like a 14 year old, and is clearly lacking social cues, she still has a self-preservation instinct. And she still does remember her past life to a certain extent, even reciting her name and rank from her past life as a Waylon Yutani employee. Who are you? Ripley Ellen, Lieutenant First Class. Number 36706. And while I'm here, I want to point out, it's like, can you tell that this movie was directed by somebody who does, like, art house films and not Hollywood productions? There's, like, some really weird moments in this movie, such as this one with Ripley and Call, as well as some of the more transitional shots that I just completely question the existence of. Like, the whole thing with Ripley in the bag, like, why did they do this with, like, the fading in and out? Is it, is it like, some weird French thing? Oui, oui, it is to symbolize the metamorphosis. It's fucking dumb. And it's not racism if you do it against the French. So this whole thing begs the question, however, it's like, how does Call know what the xenomorphs are? She's clearly here to stop them from being bred after reading up on something or figuring something out, but Ripley is adamant that they can't be stopped, and the situation goes to shit because Call gets caught and the level space rogues get into a shootout with the army guys. Now, as much as I've sung the praises of Sigourney Weaver's portrayal of Ripley 8, I think this concept would have worked better if the space pirates were the center of the plot, because after this point, it, you know, besides a few moments, we don't really get much of them. I mean, Ron Perlman is awesome, but really all the space pirates are interesting, they just really don't get enough time to be as cool as they could be. Except for Christy and Ron Perlman. So when the space pirates get into a fight with the army guys, there's all this commotion, and we finally get what we all came here for, and that's Xenomorph running amok. That fast learner comment that Dorf made, uh, yeah, maybe he should have been paying attention to that instead of doing whatever the fuck this was. And sorry to go back to that scene, but what was this? Like, William H. Macy looked at this and thought there was no amount of money worth doing that, but then Brad Dorf was like, I don't give a fuck, I have no shame. That's not what Brad Dorf sounds like, but... The Alien series has its ups and downs, but it never fumbles one of the key aspects of the Xenomorph as a quote-unquote character, and that is that this movie maintains that the Xeno is relatively intelligent and is not just some dumb animal. That's what I've always liked about the Alien, is it seems to have high intelligence and self-awareness. It's displayed in Resurrection not only with the button scene, but when it finally figures out how to escape from its cage by butchering one of its own kind to utilize the acid blood to melt through the floor. I also love this, it's like you just saw the armor-plated killing machine butcher one of its own kind to escape and you decide to go into the cage and take a look. And it would not be a late 90s, early 2000s sci-fi horror movie if it didn't have somebody getting brutally killed by liquid nitrogen. Of course, Freeze is wandering around the ship in the storage room stealing parts, and he doesn't know what the fuck is going on. But fortunately for him, when he comes face to face with a xenomorph, he has a hidden weapon. Things almost got really ugly there for a second, but this is another thing with the, the acid blood, they get a little inconsistent with it. Because it just like burned through several floors of the ship ship, and yet he gets some on him and it's just like a mild burning sensation. Now, I'm not a scientist or a chemist, I don't understand how acid works. Like, is it possible that what can burn through a fuck ton of metal on a ship might only cause like some serious irritation but no permanent damage to flesh? I don't know. Throw that in the pile of things about the Alien series that are relatively inconsistent next to the Alien's birth cycle. Because yeah, you know, Vries is perfectly fine when he gets like a pretty decent sized drip on him, but then like 
Drake gets blasted in the face with it, and they're like, well, he's dead. And then, you know, going back to Aliens in the same movie, Hudson gets it on his arm, and it's not all that bad. I guess it's like, it depends on how important the character is to the screenplay, how effective the acid is, I guess. Now, I've never understood if Vries was supposed to just be crippled and foreign, or crippled and mentally challenged and foreign, or like, French. His actor is French, so I'm assuming he isn't mentally challenged, it's just the language barrier that English isn't his first language, and when he talks, he comes off as a mentally challenged person. Like, I had a friend who thought he was mentally challenged, and was like, oh, I like that character, it's a good portrayal of somebody being mentally challenged. But I think he's just, like, quirky and in a wheelchair. Well, I say if we want to make any decent time, I say we ditch the cripple. No offense, man. None taken. What really bothers me about this movie reading up on it is that the whole scene with the evacuation was significantly cut down. Why it bothers me is because much like a lot of the more positive elements of this film, it just does not get enough time to really breathe and be used to its fullest. There were supposed to be a lot more scenes depicting the army guys trying to deal with the xenomorph breakout. In the script, there was actually supposed to be a whole scene where they attempted to contain the outbreak, which would have played out a little bit like like the marines going into the hive in Aliens. And reading up on it, the vibe I get is, what if the hive scene from Aliens happened on a setting similar to that of Alien? And that would have been really fucking cool, and it's a shame that it got cut out completely. And the whole Alien breakout thing is really done within like five minutes or so. Furthermore, I briefly spoke about how Dan Hedaya hammed it up as General Perez, and how he's played up as kind of an incompetent goof, but in the script, he was actually supposed to be a badass during this scene. He does does kind of get to show that he's not a completely incompetent leader by making sure all of his men evacuated before him. But this is really the first time we don't see him acting like a cartoon character, and it's really weird. However, I will give Dan Hedaya credit, he does take part in what I consider to be a signature xenomorph moment when the xenomorph crawls into one of the escape pods and starts slaughtering people. Now, I remember the first time I watched this movie with my dad when I was a kid. I hadn't seen the movie before, and when the xenomorph got into the pod while everybody was all locked in, I was just like, oh, that would suck. And in another memorable moment, which the, the reason this movie is so memorable will be explained at the end of the review, we got Perez seeing off the last of the soldiers, and then a xenomorph comes out and gives him a brainectomy. And I distinctly remember my dad's girlfriend being really grossed out by the part where he like pulls out a piece of his brain and looks at it. And I'll give more credit to Dan Hedaya. He actually sold this pretty well. It doesn't look overly corny. Like he's got the cross-eyed, he's clearly in a state of of shock and like the drool coming out of his mouth. I think that's what would happen if you took like a traumatic brain injury and survived it long enough to actually like fish out a little piece of your own brain and get a good look at it. It reminds me of like Itchy and Scratchy, but like the disturbing part of Itchy and Scratchy. This whole part is great, I just really wish we got what was written in the script because it sounds pretty badass. But alas, we just, I guess, didn't deserve it for whatever reason. And then we're stuck with just the survivors on the ship. And I don't know if this is them overstepping xenomorph intelligence, or perhaps it's the influence of both the human DNA and having Ripley as part of their hive mind, but it almost seems as if the xenomorphs in this movie are aware that a human would stop to look at a gun, and it seems as if they are setting a trap. Xenomorphs are very smart and they can figure stuff out, but I think setting a trap might be a little bit like I, I don't know that, that's a bit sus oh and Elgin dies so uh, I don't have a joke for this just like make up your own reference to the crow or something this movie gets the bickering between protagonists down so well, and it's such a treat because all these actors are great and they're playing off each other very well. For example, Ripley, having escaped her containment unit, finds the crew and lures the xenomorph away from the protagonists when they're cornered, and you just hear Pearlman. Right. And then Ripley blows the Xenomorph's head off and joins the crew. And this this line by Winona Ryder, it's not as good as the fuck from Alien 3, but it's pretty solid. I, I could use this in future videos. What the fuck? I really don't want to do this joke because the Nostalgia Critic did it in his review like over 10 years ago, but I really do like Winona Ryder. I think she's a solid actress, and while I don't particularly think she's hot in this movie, I 
I think she is one of the most desirable women who ever lived, and has only gotten hotter with age. But with that being said, she acts like an annoying preteen girl in this movie. And there's probably a reason for that that's gonna get explained more into the plot, but it, like, it really gets on your nerves when she's doing this. And I'm not sure if that's the point, if we're supposed to sympathize with her, if we're supposed to look at her as the bad guy, but it just, it just gets to a point where it's grating. Now wait a second here, she was the host for these monsters. Ren cloned her because she had one inside her. She's not human. The whole time, she's just complaining and whining, and it's like, shut up. She reminds me of one of those girls in middle school that just discovered what political activism is and is just way too invested for her own age and emotional intelligence level. That's all I'm gonna say, and yeah, she gets less irritating as the movie goes on, but like, fucking Christ, she's get like, she's so irritating at like the first act of the movie. So here we have it. We have the ragtags, the pirates, Ripley, Dr. Ren and Tuco who were left after the shootout, and Ren is clearly scheming. I would not expect anything less from the Dane. But he cooperates for the time being and lets them know that there are 12 more aliens aboard the ship that he knows about, and Ripley rightfully assumes there are more to come. I've heard complaints that Ripley's a little bit over the top and hammy in this movie, and yeah, sure, whatever, but this is a funny line and it really does kind of fit the Ripley 8 character. So... Who do I have to fuck to get off this boat? I like that they give Ripley more of a sense of humor after doing two movies where she was just in a miserable state as a character. Ripley deserves to be happy and make quips after all she went through, even if it is just her clone. CLONE? WHAT CLONE? And honestly, once again, Ron fucking Perlman, everybody. I can get you off. Maybe not the boat, but... And the reason they're all traveling together is because after the Xenomorph breakout, the ship basically reverted to its emergency protocols and is heading back towards Earth. So they have to get to the Betty, which is the space pirate's ship, in order to trigger the self-destruct sequence and kill all the Xenomorphs before they break loose on Earth. So yeah, Freeze finds the crew in the elevator and he delivers a one-liner that is so bad yet so great at the same time that my cousins and I have quoted it for years and still quote it. Who are you expecting, Santa Claus? I really don't know why this line is so funny. I guess it's because it's just such a blatant smart-ass remark, but it's also coming from a guy who doesn't speak English as a first language. But it's also because he's also playing someone who may be mentally challenged, so it's like, there's just too much like going on with this actor for him to do it right, but as a result, it just sounds funnier than it actually is. And this is my hot take of the video. I think Ripley and Jonner have better chemistry than Ripley and Hicks. Don't fucking at me. I heard you like ran into these things before. That's right. Wow, man. So like, what did you do? I died. I complain about them not utilizing the pirates as much, or not showing the military as much, or them not really letting the first act breathe, and yes, that is a problem. But I think another big problem I have with the second act, and as a result the whole movie, is that there isn't really a whole lot of them dealing with direct conflict with the xenomorphs. It has that similar pacing to Aliens, where it's like, yeah, they have a few encounters, but like, in Aliens, it's like they're always a looming threat. In Alien Resurrection, it never really feels like the aliens are that big of a threat. It's actually a problem I had with aliens too. It's like, why wasn't there just like a periodic thing where like a xenomorph would jump in and they'd have to deal with it? But that, that's just me complaining, I don't know. But what aliens and alien resurrection do have in common is they at least managed to cover this inconsistency up by having a lot of good conversations and character moments. The problem is with alien resurrection is they spend so much time building up to the aliens breaking out and then spend so little time letting the scenario play itself out. Like the first act of this movie is carried by the setup and then the second act is really carried by Ripley and the Space Pirates, but it doesn't really let the audience have fun watching the Xenomorphs. But I will say the second act does kick off pretty good, and it has probably the signature part of the movie and one of the best scenes in the movie, where Ripley discovers all of her clones, including Ripley 7, who is still alive somehow. Her teeth are all black, which indicates that she's just kind of been left there with minimal care, but the script actually indicated that she was supposed to have the metallic teeth like the Xenomorphs, but they couldn't get the prosthetic to work. Either way, 
Ripley is understandably upset with this and decides to put her sister clone out of its misery with a flamethrower. And don't get me wrong, this scene is powerful and kind of sad, but that's just completely broken when Call walks into frame with a flamethrower and just like hands it to Ripley as if she just wants to see some sort of suffering for a Ripley clone after her earlier attempt to euthanize Ripley 8. This is followed by like the unintentionally hilarious bit where Ripley just without hesitation just starts torching her clone alive and it's so brutal that it takes this shocking scene that was genuinely sad and just makes it unintentionally hilarious. Like that clone is suffering and everything but it's like you know, people may not realize that being burned alive is probably one of the most painful ways to die. And the nostalgia critic did this bit like you know he made the little joke at this scene too but that was over a decade ago and yeah I'm old. But really there was like a number of different ways they could have done this and it would have kept how powerful of a moment this was like they could have just had her shoot the other clone and then burn everything but i'm willing to bet it was probably easier to just torch a dummy on the set than to make a gore effect they really blew the gore effect on dan hedaya pulling his brain out i guess the ripley 7 puppet is solid it's obviously just a rig with a dummy body and weaver stuck her head through a hole in a table but it's effective All the Ripley clones are effective, and really this whole scene is just pretty gross and off-putting, like all the mutated, fucked up clones. It really does add to my opinion that out of all the Alien movies, this one actually manages to be the grossest one in the quadrilogy. It's just disgusting, and I honestly kind of love it because of that. I think the most important part about this moment is that it displays that Ripley is still human, because if she was more xenomorph than human, she'd be really not that upset about this, but she's clearly very upset. It's this display that actually makes Call decide to ease up and stop being a bitch, even punching Ren when Ripley walks away. And ladies and gentlemen, theys and thems, once again, Ron fucking Perlman. It's a big deal, man. Fucking waste of ammo. Let's go. Must be a chick thing. While making their way across the Aruga to make it to the Betty, they find all the cryotubes that were brought in, all containing the workers who were on their way to a nickel mine on a faraway planet, and most of them are dead. Besides Leland Orser, who plays Purvis, who inexplicably has not given birth to his xenomorph yet, and he's understandably freaked out while the rest of the crew argue whether or not to leave him, or kill him. So they take him because he doesn't seem to be giving birth yet, and they never really explain why his xenomorph takes so long to birth in the movie, but in the script, and in the novelization, it's stated that he has a thyroid deficiency, which would have been a nice detail to have in this film because many people bitched about this character having such a long incubation period. Incubation. Uh, incubation. I'm not re-recording it. What's inside me? No, there's got to be another way. What if we freeze him? What's in fucking inside me? The parasite! Oh, an element. A foreign elephant. Great, he's got fucking Babar living in him. Now, I said the clone scene was like the signature scene of the movie. I would say signature, like, character moment of the movie. But the second act also contains the signature action scene in the movie. In order to get to the docking bay where the pirates ship the Betty is contained, they need to swim through a flooded deck of the ship. There's a few fun facts within this scene. The first of which is that Winona Ryder was actually severely hydrophobic because of an experience where she almost drowned as a kid. As a result of that experience, she acted avoided swimming for most of her life up to this point. So that look of panic on Winona Ryder's face here is 100% real, and yes, they shot this in a huge tank. Another fun fact is that this scene wasn't even supposed to exist. This was supposed to be a scene where they drove through a big terrarium in like an all-terrain vehicle thing and like a bunch of xenomorphs were supposed to be attacking their vehicle. For budget reasons, they couldn't shoot it, so they came up with the water scene, which I, I do love this scene. A lot of people look at Alien as being the horror one, Aliens as being the action one, Alien 3 kind of being a return to form with the horror. I find Alien Resurrection tries to be a jack of all trades. It tries to do action and horror, and I don't think it really excels at either one of them on a level as high as the previous movies, but it definitely does the horror a lot better. You can even see in the trailer the way they marketed this movie. They were trying to market it as a high-octane action film. But really, this movie excels with its more slow moments, and it excels with its horror. Once again, talking about the clone scene, that's pretty horrifying. That's like a Cronenbergian body horror scene, and it's pretty much better than any of the action sequences they do in the movie. With that being said, the 
signature action scene of the movie, which is the underwater scene, is absolutely fucking horrifying and comes off better as a horror scene. For one, the idea of having to swim 90 feet underwater with nowhere to really get air if you start to like kind of slack is terrifying. 90 feet? I don't know how long that would take. Like, that, that just does not sound very fun. I personally would not be able to do that. I'd be like, you know what, I'm just gonna fucking die then. And the way the cast sells this whole idea is just, it's great. And ladies and gentlemen, and theys, one more time, Ron Perlman. To add to how terrifying this whole scenario is, and you probably knew this was going to happen even if you haven't seen the movie before, not only do they have to swim that ridiculous length completely underwater, but they get a visit from two xenomorphs who follow them in, and my god. I think this scene would be among one of the best xenomorph sequences in franchise history alongside the hive battle and the bait and chase if the CGI was just a little bit better. The strange thing about the 90s is that they did have good CGI, but it needed to be utilized under under certain conditions. Jurassic Park is a combination of animatronics and CGI, and it still looks good today because they used a combination of the CGI and they concealed it in the darkness. Like the T-Rex at night looks like an actual fucking T-Rex. Darkness is always a benefit to CGI, even to this day it makes some of the most obvious CGI look more real. The problem with Alien Resurrection and the late 90s in general is that this is when studios realized CGI was the cheap option and you could do more with it at least in terms of, for example, having a creature move around more fluidly. And as a result, they went the CGI route as much as they could instead of practical, and what we get here is just kind of a weird janky scene where the xenomorphs look like a PlayStation graphic. But what is still a pretty terrifying scene has some jank CGI xenomorphs. And trust me, if I, you know, suspend disbelief, I would definitely be shitting myself and trying to just drown if this thing grabbed me underwater like it did with Hill because this whole situation sucks. It really disappointed me that, you know, this should have been a top alien movie along with Dallas and the Vent and the other scenes I mentioned, but instead it just kind of falls flat due to its limitations. Still love the scene, still think it's terrifying, but that CGI does really take me out of it. Of course, the escalation is fine because once they actually get away from the xenomorph underwater, albeit temporarily, you know, you think they made it, they're gonna be okay, but nope, the exit from the water has that secreted resin over top of it. When they do finally get through it after after the initial panic, there are a bunch of eggs and face huggers that start coming out and attacking people. Ripley gets face hugged. <laughs> But due to her increased strength, she just kind of rips the thing off, and it keeps going, like Christy blows the eggs up, and then the xenomorph from before comes back. I find this little scene here is actually a little bit lame, like the xenomorphs chase the survivors up the ladder, Christy gets blasted in the face with acid spit, and the acid spit is a little bit of a later addition to the xenomorph lore, like, you know, that they can spit acid as a defense mechanism. It was introduced in Alien 3, and it was for a young xenomorph that hadn't matured yet. It's a perfectly logical addition to xenomorph physiology, I don't mind it, like they bleed acid, they could probably spit it too. But it's just the way that they, it, it, I don't know if it's the CG, I don't know if it's just kind of like bleh, but this scene doesn't really do too much for me, but hey, at least it has Ron Perlman. Die! And the final fun fact for this whole scene is that Ron Perlman actually almost died shooting this scene. Apparently he knocked himself unconscious and fell into the water and almost drowned. And I'm glad that Ron Perlman didn't die because I like Ron Perlman. And to the surprise of nobody, during the whole commotion, Dr. Ren tricks Call into giving him her gun and shoots her, betraying the group. Okay, so this is another Nostalgia Critic reference, and this is the last one I'm going to be doing for this review, because it is a little hacky to constantly reference a past review. But it really doesn't make sense that Christy just, like, dies. He's hurt, he got blasted in the face with acid, but, like, you know, he cuts himself off. It's supposed to be this big heroic sacrifice so that Vreeze can get up, but it's like... How does this work? Like, he got a little bit of acid in his face. He doesn't look like he's going blind. He's not bleeding out. Freeze got acid on him. He seems okay. So, like, I don't know. Maybe the acid is toxic, but not really. It's just, it's, it's dumb. They should have really thought up a better death for this character. They should have had him get, like, face hugged or something and then fall into the water. That probably would have made a bit more sense, but let's just move past it. Now, they obviously weren't going to kill off the second build actress midway through the movie, and Call does survive, which I don't know how she got 
in and around the entire thing, so don't question it. And, you know, it wouldn't be an alien movie if there wasn't an android, and Call is an android. What bothers me here is that Ripley refers to her as a robot, and considering Ripley's experience with androids, she probably would have known the proper terminology, or at least would have called her, like, a synthetic or whatever. De Stefano, though, is, like, nerding out over this. He loves technology, and he starts talking about, like, what happened to the androids between the events of Alien 3 and Resurrection, and explains that androids started building other androids, and that the whole thing killed the android industry, but a few of them got away. Man, I ne never, never thought that I would see one! Great. She's a toaster oven. Can we leave now? It also kind of serves to connect Ripley and Call more to each other, because much like Ripley, Call is the last of a dying breed. I kind of do like this twist, even if it's executed a little poorly. Like, they do kind of build it up throughout the movie. We get, like, some small hints here and there. Like, we notice she's pretending to be drunk when drinking with Jonna and Christy, and that she's able to snap a knife like she did. Like, you know, that's not easy to do with a knife, even if you have leverage. Like, a human might have bent it, but to completely snap the blade off, like, that, that's no easy task. She had to have had super strength. I'm sure there's other examples, I just didn't bother to write them down. The only real inconsistency is how Ripley couldn't really figure it out because she has the heightened senses that xenomorphs have. She could tell that Purvis had a chest burster just by looking at him. She would have probably had that ingrained thing that xenomorphs have where they ignore synthetics unless threatened or severely pissed off. Because yeah, they can tell a xenomorph. It's This is more late addition to the lore, but they can tell. I'm spending a little bit too much time picking at the logic of this very bizarre movie movie, so again, let's move forward. Call really does kind of chill on the whininess, and I think this is because, like, the third act was heavily rewritten by Fox, because they apparently did not like Joss Whedon's third act. And Winona Ryder and Sigourney Weaver play off each other nice, the characters are all warmed up to each other, and it's nice. A lot of people say there's weird lesbian overtones with the Call and Ripley relationship, and yeah, I'm not gonna deny that you get that idea looking at it, but I always kind of felt that maybe they were going for more of a mother-daughter thing because Ripley lost not only her biological daughter, but her surrogate daughter, and Call is young and, like, you know, kind of relates to Ripley, but they could have actually just kind of done away with the lesbian tease, which I know lesbian teases were huge in the late 90s, but it should have been a more parental relationship. But that's okay, because Call invades the mainframe and says funny shit to Ren over the intercom. Father? Father! I believe this was another bit of dialogue added to the special edition, but to follow up the earlier part with the picture of the little girl, Ripley does bring up Newt when talking to Call, and she admits that she can't even remember her name. Which is, like, really sad. Like, Ripley can't catch a break. Her whole life was full of nothing but fucking nightmares, and now what little positive memories she may have are completely scrambled from the cloning process. And we learn that Call, in fact, did know about the Xenomorphs and was inspired to make sure that they never get used by the United Systems or anybody. So in the script, this was also cut from the movie, there was initially something that actually kind of connected Alien Resurrection to 3 a little bit more. In the novelization, Call was inspired by a book titled Star Beast, itself a reference to the working title of the first film. And Star Beast was supposed to be the account of the events from Alien 3 as written by the character of Morse, the sole survivor of the Fury 161 incident. This was left out likely because they wanted to try and help people forget about Alien 3 as much as possible, but it is a neat little piece of trivia, and I choose to look at it as canon. So Ripley is still mentally tied to the Hive, and she ends up falling into way more Xenomorphs than 12, but, you know, when you think about it, there were a lot of people who got snatched up during the outbreak, so I'll forgive Ren for his bad counting. Then we get to the most ridiculous part of the movie. Well, no, it's not really the most ridiculous, but it's, it's still pretty out there. Purvis gets shot by Ren, who was on the Betty somehow, and it triggers him into going into labor, so to speak. Now, usually the Xenomorph birthing process is extremely painful, and it's almost like paralyzing to the person who is suffering it. They go into convulsions, they thrash about. So Purvis gets up, freaks the fuck out, beats Ren half to death in what I can only assume was just some huge adrenaline rush, and then holds Ren's head in place while the Xenomorph bursts through his chest. And in bursting through his chest, it also goes through Ren's head. It's so over the top and needlessly violent that I kind of love it. This whole sequence 
sequence makes literally no sense whatsoever, and I think that just makes it better. That, my friends, is the wonder of film. There's a spectrum of how far things can go before suspension of disbelief is just impossible. This scene, it, it's, it's, I call this the Super Mario Bros. equation, because you know how Mario in the Mario Bros. game, like, he runs across and then ends up on the other side? Basically, imagine there's, like, a scale and a needle, and it goes so far into stupidity that it just comes back around the other side and ends up at the top of, like, the awesome scale. It's just, my god, I love this. Well, on the plus side, Brad Dorff is back, and he's acting as crazy as ever. But on the negative side, you know, I really don't like this aspect of the movie. Like, the queen morphs into some weird second stage due to Ripley's human DNA, where she grows a womb and gives birth to a weird hybrid alien xenomorph-human thing. I know alien and xenomorph are the same thing, but just move past it. Promotional materials refer to this thing as the newborn, and the newborn kills the queen because it sees Ripley as its mother, and then it bites Brad Dorff's head off. This thing's just, like, gross-looking, and it kind of goes with the whole gross feeling that this movie has as a whole. But what if I told you that initially the newborn was supposed to have fully formed human sex organs on it? Like, the animatronic of this thing actually had a dick and a vagina, but Fox had to step in and be like, okay, no, digitize that out, and so they did. I previously mentioned that the whole third act of this movie was heavily altered. Whedon submitted five different drafts that had the crew dealing with a large-sized white alien that would have climaxed on Earth, but Fox didn't like it, and eventually just rewrote the entire thing themselves. As a result, it feels a little bit disjointed from the rest of the movie. It's not terribly bad, but it does kind of wrap itself up pretty quick. The ending is not great. I don't like that they killed DeStefano off because he was a cool character, even though his death is pretty gnarly. And then Ripley, despite not wanting to do it, kills the newborn by causing it to get sucked through a piece of glass she melts with her acid blood. It's sad because, like, they actually have the newborn speak and it emotes, and it is partially human and self-aware and clearly Ripley feels bad, but it's one of those things where it's like, it had to be done. I mean, I will give it credit for subverting several tropes that are present within the Alien movies. For one, usually the Xenomorph just gets kind of spat out into space, you know, not really painful, whatever, and you're cheering for it. This, you're seeing a poor creature, probably with the mind of a child, that has self-awareness, getting, like, brutally sucked out of a ship, and it's like, oh, yeah, and then you just start really feeling bad. Because, yeah, like, you, you think about it from Ripley's POV, the thing thinks Ripley's his mother, Ripley has a connection to the Xenomorphs, and it's just, like, dying this slow and horribly painful death. Although, I don't feel too bad because that thing killed Stefano. <laughs> Now, the theatrical cut ended with them just simply seeing the skyline, but the extended cut restored the scene where Call and Ripley are just hanging out in the ruins of France. Oh, and one last time, everybody, this time for real, Ron Perlman. All I really have to say about Alien Resurrection is it's a very bizarre movie. It's fucking weird, it's a little disjointed, and conceptually, it's pretty out there. There are plenty of issues with the movie. Most of them revolve around it being kind of dumb and, like, having too many cooks with the story. But, you know, while it's not great, it's not the worst one in the series. I wouldn't even really call it the worst one in the original quadrilogy. I think I would throw that dishonor onto the theatrical version of Alien 3. For all its flaws, it has some great characters and a amazing cast, some very entertaining moments, and is generally well made aside from a few minor flaws in the production. I really don't dislike any of the movies in the quadrilogy. I have opinions on all of them, both positive and negative, but all in all, they're all pretty watchable to me, and Alien Resurrection is very watchable. But what if I told you I used to really not like this movie? Like, I had an irrational hatred of this movie, and I still to this day can't understand why. I think I was really hung up on how it was kind of really dumb and has all these weird moments 
Gremlins, and trust me, I'm not a fan of the attempt at the artsy scenes or the newborn. I truly think the main contributing factor as to why I once hated this movie was that it aired on cable so much when I was a kid. The Space Network, Space Channel, whatever they called it, used to do this thing, you know, where they showed a movie every weekend, and I've mentioned it before, it was called Movies from Space. I saw a lot of movies I really liked on there for the first time, including some of the other Alien movies, The Blob, The Fly, and, you know, a few more. The issue is, like, near the end, I think they were losing a lot of rights to movies, they were getting ready to wrap up the whole concept of movies from space, so they aired Alien Resurrection and Alien 3 a lot. Now, 3 was saved by the fact that it had a much more extensive extended edition when I got the Quadrilogy box set, like, it was basically a whole new movie. But while Alien Resurrection's extended cut did add some much needed character moments and dialogue, at the time, it didn't really do anything to fix my perception of it. I'd simply seen this movie so many times that I was just completely sick of it, and it took a long time for me to become unsick of it. I'm a firm believer in the fact that the Alien series is pretty open to a lot of different ideas, and that pretty much anybody with any inkling of creativity could make a good Alien movie. Besides Ridley Scott, oddly enough, because the Ugh. Ten years ago, if you would have asked me my opinion on Alien Resurrection, I would have said it's stupid, it's dumb. All it was was an attempt to do a box office cash-in, and it was just your average dumb late 90s summer movie. But looking at it now, I really do like it for what it is. It's so far removed from the timeline that, you know, we it doesn't really interfere with anything, and we get to see Sigourney Weaver fight aliens one last time. Do I think it's a bad movie? Yes, but it's like fun bad, and it does have some genuinely cool moments, and I accept it as part of the Alien canon. Could it have been better? Sure, but it could have been much worse. It could have been Prometheus or Covenant. Contemporary critics have labeled Alien Resurrection with the dreaded popcorn movie allegations, which I don't like that term. It's the implication that, oh, you you know, you go for the popcorn. It's like, no, I don't think Alien Resurrection's like that. I think the problem with Alien Resurrection, first and foremost, is how much they chopped out during pre production. I mentioned that there was supposed to be more with the army guys, there was also supposed to be a lot more xenomorph encounters, which kind of addresses the earlier claim that I made of the xenomorphs not being presented as that much of a threat in the midway point of the movie. But sadly, Fox was going on the whole spend less money, make more money thing, and as a result, we got what we got. I think what happened was this movie was intended to be more actionized, but due to the cuts in budget, they decided to go for more of a horrors of science type thing, and this is seen with the whole clone scene. Following that up with more claustrophobic horror, but adding in high octane action whenever they could. But the sad reality is, I think the movie's critical reception is probably because they cut so many of the character moments out. Like, the little bits that they have in this special edition do improve that, and I actually do really like this movie because of it. Even if it is, severely flawed. For a while, Alien Resurrection became kind of like a punching bag for the series, like it was always looked at as like the shark jump one or the bad one, which is really funny because the theatrical cut of Alien 3 is far worse. I have noticed that fans have kind of turned around on Alien Resurrection over the years. I think that's because of uh, Prometheus and Alien Covenant stinking up the franchise. But at the time, yeah, this movie kind of just came and went from the box office. Like, I just remember seeing some bus ads on the TTC a few times, and I didn't really see it until it aired on television. I didn't even see a trailer for it, I think, until I got the box set. And I'm looking at this trailer, I'm like, wow, they really marketed this as an action movie and it just wasn't, that probably contributed to some of the negative reactions to it. But as it stands now, I think people kind of just look at it as it's okay, but I think it's a little bit better than okay. It's really fun. It's really the last time that the Alien franchise ever felt like the Alien franchise, which kind of reinforces my opinion that Ridley Scott is not the Alien franchise. I think overall my main issue with Alien Resurrection is that it tries to play itself like an action movie, but it just does the horror so much more effectively. And it's also like the most violent movie in the quadrilogy, like you, you see a lot here. I was discussing with a friend the whole quadrilogy and he mentioned, it's like yeah it seems like in 3 and 4 they were going more for the violence because like yeah 1 and 2 are violent movies,
movies, but they're not over the top. And the movie comes off as a little bit overproduced, but it under delivers. And I attribute this to them for some reason getting a director who, for all intents and purposes, was not suited for the job. That's not to say Genet did a poor job directing it, it just didn't really seem like his forte, and it's clear he wanted to focus more on the characters and the dialogue than the alien carnage. But in a movie like this, you need to have a balance of both. Do I think this movie gets too much flack? Yes, because it's treated like it's this awful bad movie, but the thing is, it was derived from a parody script, and they simply just decided to play it straight. This is the same year that Starship Troopers came out, and for some reason nobody got that it was a fucking satire. Resurrection is flawed and sometimes stupid, and obviously the director put a weird spin on it, but it doesn't pretend to be anything on the level of the first two. It's nowhere near being like the worst sequel ever made, like some people make it out to be. And I would argue that when viewed alongside the rest of the quadrilogy, it fits in perfectly. In fact, it's actually a good bookend to the quadrilogy because it does make some pretty good callbacks to previous movies. It calls back the first movie quite a bit, like the ship setting, the design of the Aruga's interiors, which does kind of channel the look of the Nostromo. A funny little reference where the computer is called Father, whereas in Alien it was called Mother. It did a good job of adjusting the overall feel of the Alien movies to the late 90s, and it does carry on the legacy of Alien being a series that plays off of corporate and government corruption. A lot of people like to look at this movie as a what-if, but nah, it's canon. It's so far in the future that it can't possibly interfere with any other movie they decide to do in the future. And maybe that's why people have kind of gone easier on it in recent years, especially since Ridley Scott's Alien movies that he's done recently have been garbage. Now one last little thing I want to throw on at the end of this is that there was a licensed video game based on this movie, and it did come out three years after the movie came out due to production issues, but it was extremely noteworthy in that it was the first dual stick first person shooter game which revolutionized the whole concept of the first person shooter. That's right, an alien licensed game made by Argonaut Games who made Star Fox was like the grandfather of the modern day shooter. That's neat. But all in all, I, I love this movie. There's no denying it. it. It's so good, and yet so bad at the same time. So what did you think of Alien Resurrection? Did you like it? Did you hate it? Do you maybe want to reassess it based on some points that I brought up? Let me know in the comments. And holy shit, I am not doing a video this long again for a very long time until I do my three year anniversary video, which is going to be like probably just as long, if not longer. So um, if you like the video, give me a like, comment, subscribe, all that good shit. And uh, I'll see you next time.